Bam. This is Dan McLaughlin, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. And I love that I get to do this stuff. It's so it's so great to be able to talk to you and reach out. You know, we're part of a group of people that uh, communicate via email, and we get to talk about current affairs. And 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 oftentimes these these chats are so powerful and they're so insightful, and there's so many different points of view that are very educated. You you start to get an understanding of just how complex the world is. And uh, and and you've written since you wrote your DeSantis piece yesterday. You had to write two more, and there's always something else complex to talk about. So I always appreciate when you come on and take time to talk about the world. Yeah, glad to be here. I mean, DeSantis is, let's face it, if you're a conservative journalist, DeSantis is fascinating because he's, you know, he's the guy who has ideas, he has a record, he has a strategy, um, all of which we've kind of been missing for a while from our leadership. So, uh, you know, whether or not you like him, uh, at least there's there's something you can sink your teeth into and 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 see that this guy is you know he's thinking it through he's he's coming up with his own answers. A, a guy I met along the way, just just like you, is a guy named Robert Hunter. He's a doctor. He's a PhD. He's a he's an ambassador. You know, and he was Clinton's ambassador to NATO, and he's worked with every administration since the Johnson administration. So he goes way way back, and he, and he's a Democrat, and so he looks at these things. We talk about foreign policy. And he's like, there's just not been anybody good since he's like, and I'm going to say it as a Democrat, since George Bush, the elder, everybody else has been wanting. And it does seem like uh, DeSantis, should he decide to run, should he get elected, he is a little more choppy in that area. And in a good way, not choppy like rough, but he has some skill because he's had to deal with a lot of international things. Because really, Miami is an international city. Yeah, I mean, uh, Florida has... Um, it, I mean, it's got an extremely long border, obviously, a border on the sea. Uh, it's, it's almost all border. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's probably, I, other than Hawaii, there's probably not a state in the country that is, um, you know, where so much of the land mass of the state is, you know, within, within like two miles of the beach. Yeah. Yeah. You think about the complex problems that he has, you know, when, when a bunch of people end up on the Dry Tortugas, the least visited national park in our nation, that's not easy to provision. There's not water there. And so you're you're sort of like, oh, gosh, now I have this literally an emergency. You know, like if this was a thousand Americans who were stranded there, they we would activate the Navy and it would be no problem. But he's been giving these problems as as the political world tries to fight itself. And and having to sort that out has to give him some valuable perspective on how to deal with that. And then also, I just want to add in, there's a lot of import exporting stuff that goes in and out of Florida, you even like to go like to Puerto Rico, which would then become an import, even though it's still within the confines of the U.S. All of this stuff gives him a unique vision of at least how to handle the American side of the foreign policy game. Yeah, I mean, people sometimes, you know, as a presidential prospect, people sometimes compare DeSantis to Scott Walker. Right. Mm. There's another guy who was a, a, a conservative governor with a great sort of domestic policy record that excited a lot of conservatives. And he, you know, he really didn't go anywhere uh, in the national in national politics. There's a bunch of reasons for that. But, you know, fundamentally, Walker had almost never been outside of Wisconsin his whole life. Right. And yeah. Wisconsin is I mean, it, it's not, you know, I suppose technically you could reach there by sea from Canada. But, you know, it's really not you know, on the edge of anything. Um, and, you know, it's quite different to have a guy who's, you know, who's been in the Navy uh, in, you know, Iraq, in uh, Guantanamo Bay, you know, who's been in Congress. Uh, so somebody who's, who's, who's dealt with and thought through a lot of these kinds of issues. Yeah. And, and let's just take political party out of this for a second. And I, I put this thing on Twitter and gosh, no one listens to my Twitter, but, you know, I'm always curious on what, if you were going to design a president and like what qualities do you need? And I don't know that it matters. Like truly, like you could take someone who is, and this is no knock on him, but President Obama had very little on his resume that made him presidential. And then you have someone like President Bush the Elder, you're like, wow, this is the perfect president. And these guys had completely different outcomes on what they do. So, so let's just stay that up front. But if you were going to design someone, gosh, I think I would design someone who had a lot of the characteristics and experiences that Ron DeSantis has. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, when you say, you know, you were going to, 
I, I mean, you know, who would you design as the perfect president? Obviously, the answer to that partly is George Washington, because they literally wrote down the job requirements for the office <laughs> while he was sitting at the front of the room. Um, but yeah, I mean, when Obama ran, I, I I did a whole thing about sort of the five major categories of presidential experience, right? Mm. Of like, you know, you've got your executive experience, um, you've got your political leadership experience, whether it's being, you know, a state governor or like a party chairman or the head of a legislative caucus. Um, you know, you've got your military combat experience. Uh, you've got your national security experience, whether it's, you know, from from something from from being in the military or an ambassador or something like that. And you've got your private sector business experience. And most presidents, I, I think probably Bush, Andrew Jackson, H.W. Uh, Bush, Andrew Jackson and George Washington are probably the only guys who could say they really checked all five boxes. Mm. Right. And so we've had a lot of successful presidents who didn't. Uh, Obama was virtually the the only one I could think of who didn't check any of the five. Right, uh, right. He, he had nothing um, coming in. So, I mean, that's your spectrum. But look, I've always liked the idea. I liked it with Mike Pence. I liked it with Bobby Jindal, who I was a big fan of uh, in the la you know the last contested cycle of having somebody who's been both a governor and in Congress because it it gives you it means yeah. you've seen the inside game and the outside the Beltway game. You know, you've lived in the world that's outside of D.C. and you've worked in enough of D.C. to understand how it operates. And so I do think that, that you know, experience wise, that's, you know, something DeSantis brings to the table. Um, obviously, the big one that he's missing out of those out of those is the private sector experience. He spent a year as a history teacher. Um, he spent a little time um, uh, doing basically, I think. I, I think he may have spent a little bit of time in private law practice. I'm not even sure if he spent any, though. It was very little between mm. sort of his, you know, his DOJ time and, and or, or military time and then running for Congress. So he's got very little in the way of private sector experience. That's his that's, you know, for him, that's the, the one box that's kind of missing. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Trump will make a big issue of that. Uh, yeah. Because that's that's obviously the, the place where Trump most of Trump's experience comes in is, is the private sector. One of the weird things about how we run our country is uh, if you have a cult's personality, you're eligible, right? And so you can, The Rock can run and The Rock would get a lot of votes. So you have this desire to say, hey, uh, enough of that, like enough generals. We don't want any generals right now, right? Uh, and sometimes you want a businessman. But Donald Trump didn't really work out too well. He was a, as much of a problem as he was, like, probably more of a problem than he was a success. You also wouldn't want someone like, Travis Kalanick, the founder and CEO, former CEO of Uber running. Like it just doesn't, we don't like that right now. And so we have these things where a certain attribute gets deranked and maybe we do want a, a fresh face like a President Obama to come in and sort of shake up the establishment. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer that politics is a craft. So, I mean, I like the idea of the citizen politician, right? The guy who has done other things in the world besides be a politician. Um, you know, and there are successful politicians who've never done anything else, right? Guys like like Marco Rubio or Chuck Schumer, who basically went like right into elected office when they were like 23 and have never done anything else. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm a big believer in, OK, you do something else and then you go into politics uh, and you bring some experience from outside of politics. But I also think it's not great to get promoted all the way up the food chain, like for your first gig. Right. I mean, I think that I, I, I you know, I think. Had Trump started off as a mayor or a governor, um, I mean, I always said the one job I would definitely vote for Trump uh, would be mayor of New York, because I think he mm. actually had more than sufficient experience and understanding of the New York landscape that he would probably have done a pretty decent, even for all of his flaws, a pretty decent job as mayor of New York. But I think if you put, if you made Trump a mayor or a governor first, you know, I think some of his flaws would have been exposed, but also mm. some of the things that he didn't understand when he became president, he would have had a better idea of going in. So I do think that there's, you know, that preparation where, you know, you, you don't call somebody up necessarily from, uh, you know, the sandlots directly mm. to the World Series, right? right. You, you, you got to work, you, even if you skip a few steps because you're really talented, you, yeah. you don't just go straight from, from zero to, you know, 
uh, I guess, un unless you're Jackie Robinson. He's the only one who pulled it off, right? And, and he wasn't supposed to. He was hitting less than 200 at UCLA. So let's just understand yeah. that. That's how improbable right. that was. And then spent right. three years in the Army, and then they just dropped him in the middle of the Negro Leagues and, the, and, and immediately he, hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's providential, right? Also, we have to make sure we mentioned uh, the rookie. You break your arm and get those ligaments to tighten up, and maybe you can go straight from the stands to the uh, to the mound. But that's just a little uh, culture pop culture reference. I, I wanted – I want to say this too because it's important to me that, that that anybody can really consume this. This is not about hey, let's vote for Ron Santis, but Ron DeSantis. But but let's look at like if we, here's the thing that bugs me, Dan. Is we don't we don't have like oh bam, both these choices, Democrat Republican, if that's what we're stuck with. Uh, both these guys are so good, and and they really do could do a great job. I am torn as to which incredible person we don't get that person right, and so so we're going to say things like uh, Ron DeSantis is stupid, he's a racist, which is the standard trope, and and then on the right they look at the people who run and they say the same things, and, and to everybody's defense, the Republicans and the Democrats as parties have all this time to develop and find the best person, and and it never happens, and <laughs> we're left with. Gosh, a bunch of people that could be, it's probably, if you and I had done something like what Secretary Clinton, President Biden, and President Trump had done, we'd, we'd be in jail with our classified management. So we have, we don't get great choices, but we also don't allow good, a good choice, maybe, if DeSantis is a good choice. We don't allow that to happen. Why the hell is that? Yeah, I mean, it is depressing because it's, on the one hand, look, there's a tendency of partisans to insist that the other guy must be terrible in every way and bad at everything. Um, and and so it's harder to have these conversations uh, in, uh, you know, in public policy. But that being said, it really is true, I think, that the last several presidential cycles have seen a progressive, um, successive decline in the quality of candidates that each party is putting up. And I think that's, it's happening in different ways, maybe, and for different reasons in in each of the two parties, they have their own pathologies. Um, you know, the Democrats historically have, um, although I, I, I guess Biden's an exception to this, the Democrats historically have, when they want, you know, they, they, they sort of fall in love with somebody who's young and new and smooth yeah. and, you know, they like intellectual, they like their people to be intellectuals that, you know, they, they uh, so Obama sort of stroked a lot of those different instincts whereas the republicans much more tend to be like we need a general we need a businessman we need a get it done guy from outside yeah. of politics right so yeah. so the democrats the democrats you know they used to say republicans fall in line democrats fall in love and the yeah. democrats still fall in love republicans have stopped falling in line um or at least not in any anything like the old way of sort of just giving it you know, just always giving the job to whoever is, mm. uh, you know, whoever's turn it is. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, just the fact that the candidates are getting, they're getting older and older, and yet uh, a lot of them are getting, you know, and yet with both Trump and Obama, you've got people with less of the kinds of experience and backgrounds that we would typically expect from a presidential candidate. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, when Trump ran against Hillary, like, you know, I mean, these were like the two most unpopular candidates in the history of American presidential politics. And it's like, yeah. how did Trump win? Well, because they couldn't both lose. That's how Trump won. Um, <laughs> I mean, there were some historical dynamics pushing in that direction, too, of it being a Republican. But, yeah. but you know, when you run two profoundly unpleasant, unpopular and dishonest candidates, they somebody's got to win. Yeah. And when you look at the... Uh the approval for these people. You can see the news day and you can probably look up the story. Like, for example, one of the biggest hits that Secretary Clinton took was when her husband hopped on Loretta Lynch's plane. That was untenable. Like that was a hit that they could not recover from because no one, I don't care what happened. No one takes that seriously. Right. And with Donald Trump, it's, it's hit after hit. And some of it's cooked up by the press because it makes, it sells Cadillacs. But a lot of it, he did himself on purpose to himself. I mean, he was the shoot himself in the foot in this guy there was who called his shot. He, he is so self-destructive. And so we are stuck with these, these candidates that have no ability to create a consensus. And so we remain divided. Yeah. And I mean, you had, you know, uh, a couple of months of honeymoon 
at the beginning of the Biden presidency and the beginning of the Obama presidency. But basically, we have had a president whose approval rating is below 50 percent for, right. you know, like 80, 90 percent of the months <laughs> since since the beginning of calendar year 2005. Yeah. Right. So yeah. ever since George W. Bush's reelection, we've had unpopular Bush then unpopular Obama, then unpopular Trump, and now unpopular Biden, right? The the voters just, are, they, they're running out of patience with these guys faster and faster. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, boy, I mean, we could talk about that part all day long. Um, and we definitely have a, pen, uh, a penchant, from to be fancy in French, for voting against someone as opposed to for someone. And that's really like who can defeat Trump? who can defeat Biden is, is the strategy. And it's because you're trying to be less. And look, that was the end of George Bush's thing too. Like we're voting against what George Bush was, right? It's almost like you're just you're not voting for reform. You're just voting for not any more of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, I, I mean, it's funny in retrospect, given how much stuff um, has, you know, it's funny in retrospect now that Bill Clinton was so unpopular when he got elected that he only got forty three percent of the vote. Because yeah. um, Bill Clinton is, you know, about as talented a natural politician as you will ever see in your entire life, and sure. yet there was all this stuff that stuck to him up to a point. It, it never stopped him, but there right. was stuff that that was a drag on him um, that you know seems almost quaint today. I mean. You know, yeah, yeah, he was a, you know, womanizer and he smoked pot and he dodged the draft and it's like, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the other interesting things I, I pointed out in my piece about DeSantis is that, um, you know, we have not had, since the end of the Cold War, we have not had a president who has been, you know, boots on the ground in a combat zone. Obviously, DeSantis as a lawyer was not out there on, you know, uh, the front line. Yeah. Um, but you know, he was in theater, he was, you know, interrogating the bad guys and stuff. And, you know, he's, 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 he's been there. Uh, yeah. and we have consistently from 92 on, um, almost invariably voted for, uh, you know, either we've had a choice between two candidates who didn't serve, or yeah. if one of them served, the voters have always, always chosen the one with the lesser service record. Right. I mean, Bush and Gore both served. Yep. Bush was in the Air National Guard stateside. Gore was a journalist in Vietnam, but he was in theater. Uh, yep. So, you know, by any any sort of objective measurement, you would say, well, OK, you know, Bush served. Yep. Gore's, Gore's service record is a little more impressive because he was there. He was in Vietnam um, and, and Bush was, you know, flying jets over the Gulf. Um, but. Every single time the voters were given a choice and it's not one party or the other. McCain, Kerry, Dole, Gore, uh, you know, the, the voters are like, no, nah, no, nah, man, not the veteran this time. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's a weird. It's a weird pattern uh, for sure. The when you look at someone like DeSantis, uh, there are chinks in his armor. You know, no candidate is perfect. I'm curious what you think his areas of weaknesses are besides the service time and business. And then we have this, um, let me back up. Let me say this. So you talked earlier about 43% is about the running average for all of the recent presidents. And it doesn't sit well with you. If you're a Democrat, you're like, wait a second, Biden has got better approval than that. He doesn't, he doesn't track consistently with Donald Trump's level of approval. And that certainly doesn't track with Obama's, but the reality is true. And the same goes the other direction. The Republicans would be like, of course, Donald Trump was was adored and was rated higher. So we can't even accept the reality that we're not very happy as a nation with our presidents, regardless of, of party. And so when you look at someone like DeSantis, can someone who's in the middle or maybe left but influenceable, can they even stomach the next person in line after having so many like we're, we're like antebellum with our quality of presidents right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I do worry that we're antebellum in a lot of ways that, that are disturbing. Uh, you know, things are not as bad as they were in the 1850s. But, right, uh, right. you know, so some of the poisonous nature of our politics these days is a bit uh, reminiscent of that. I mean, look, it, the the presidents look a lot more popular, I suppose, if you compare them to Congress's approval. Right? Well, that's but, always true, right? Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, DeSantis, in terms of weaknesses, um, I mean, look, obviously he's... The more, 
you know, as they say in politics, you know, friends come and go, enemies accumulate, right? So the more stuff he has, you know, his one of his strengths is also one of his weaknesses, which is he's done a lot of stuff. He's gotten a lot of stuff done. Mm. And he has, you know, stepped on a lot of toes in Florida. So, you know, there's a lot of people who have sort of this or that particular grievance with him. And that that's an issue. Um, I mean, I think clearly... Uh, one issue is simply the fact that he's got Donald Trump, you know, he's in Donald Trump's way. Um, right. And that's going to be an issue in the primary. Um, and depending on how he handles it, or it may or may not in the general, if, if DeSantis gets past him, how do you how do you get past him without, you know, incensing a lot of the people who prefer Trump? But, um, you know, I mean, the other thing that's going to be interesting um, is that it, DeSantis is not... Um, you know, he's not a shrinking violet. He's not a he's not a, you know, a quiet guy who's going to disappear on the big stage. But he is also not he's not Bill Clinton. He's not mm. warm and fuzzy. He's not extroverted. He is, in fact, fairly severely introverted by all accounts of people who mm. have dealt with him on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, there is going to be that issue of you know, is is this a guy who maybe is not going to have, you know, he doesn't, he's not charming. Um, right. You know, he's, 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 a, he's a prosecutor. He's a sledgehammer. You know, he comes in and he just tells you, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, these are the things I'm going to get done. Um, you know, in some ways he reminds me a little bit, I mean, he reminds me a little bit of, of Chris Christie, but, but he's not quite as, Christie is also a very sort of mm. extroverted Greek raconteur kind of guy. Uh, in other ways, he reminds me a little bit of Dick Cheney, who was a guy who just sort of, you know, Cheney, Cheney was was an unusual creature in American political communication because, you know, he didn't talk to you like he was talking to a room full of kindergartners. He talked to you like he was, you know, a CEO presenting something to the board. Right. right. Like and he would do that talking to the American people, which was very unusual. I liked it. Not everybody mm. did. Um, but, you know, DeSantis has a bit of that affect of like, look, you know, I'm all business. Uh, I'm here to tell you about, you know, here's here's what we're going to do today. Here's what right. my proposals are. Um, you know, I mean, he, he's, uh, you know, he can be very specific. Uh, no. Specific can be good and it can be bad. The more specific you get on the more <laughs> things, the less you become all things to all people. There's so many things I want to ask you about right now, but let me just ask you this. So President Trump is an obstacle that, if he runs, Governor DeSantis will have to deal with, right? So is it a negotiation and, a, you know, some kind of like, you got to put my guys in the cabinet or does DeSantis just run over the top of him and say, nobody, not enough people are going to vote for you, old man, and I don't need to give you anything. I mean, like, what do you, what's his approach? Does he try to placate? And when the time comes, there's a deal. I mean, Pete Buttigieg is a secretary because he was a viable presidential candidate and got out of the way eventually, right? So what do you think happens if you were to guess two years yeah. in the future. I mean, it's an interesting question and I don't know the answer to that. I know that, you know what I'm sure of? I'm sure DeSantis has thought it through and he has a plan. Now, as as Mike Tyson used to say, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Yeah. So we'll see how his plan holds up once he gets punched in the face. I mean, I don't think that you can do a kind of conventional deal with Trump in the mm. sense that like, because you can't be like, well, I'm going to put your people in the administration because Trump's answer to that is going to be, I got one people and there's one job for him and it's at the top, um, mm -hmm. right? It's Trump's not going to care about anybody else. He's not going to take, you know, even if you're, if you're like, you know, I'm going to put Don Jr. at that running the treasury or something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he's, that's not going to, he's not going to go for that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is one reason why I think it is, you know, I wrote a column on this some months ago about, and, and I sort of made this point a bit in the magazine piece as well, but I do think it'll be a, a tremendous test of, sort of whether DeSantis has what it takes to be a really great commander in chief yeah. to see how he handles this, right? Because the world is full of sort of rough characters, right? And so if you want to know, you know, and 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 a lot of them are people you don't have the power to just tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't shoot them. Uh, <laughs> you know, how are you going to deal with Xi? How are you going to deal with Putin? How are you going to deal with Erdogan? How are you going to deal with, you know, even sort of your more kind of tin pot elected authoritarians like, you know, AMLO and Trudeau? Uh, yeah. How are you going to deal with Modi? Uh, you know, these are these are these are very, very difficult people. 
uh, and they're powerful people. Uh, yeah. And how you maneuver your way around um, Trump is it's actually a pretty good test of that. It's like, um, you know, if you've played like, you know, diplomacy uh, for those, those of our, our viewers who are into that or other kind of, you know, games of bluff and strategy where you're just trying to like figure out how to deal with people that you can't just overpower. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like this is a good simulation in that sense because, <laughs> because you know, he's got it. It's easy for Joe Biden to deal with Donald Trump, right? Because Joe Biden can just be like, you know, a pox on you and all your works and your voters can right. go screw yeah. Um, yeah. and and because he's he's operating from an alternate political base, DeSantis has to work the inside game of a party where Trump remains popular with a big faction of the voters. And so, you know, finessing that is going to be difficult. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure how he's going to pull it off, but but I'm pretty sure he has a plan. Sure. And there's people that make a lot of money helping you develop these plans and go forward. There's another foe in his way, too. Should he go decide to run and and uh, go be the nominee? There's that Democratic Party and the machine that comes with that. And that's a lot of constant negative media attention. You know, this is just something we see. This is how the machine works. You have to figure out how to defeat this. The current uh, problem du jour is... He um, he's a racist and he doesn't allow kids in Florida to learn black history, which is is isn't and hasn't been true. But but it is these kind of attacks that are going to come at him. And then there's also the um, he and Gavin Newsom are sort of the antithesis of one another. Gavin's like no gas stoves and it's just like I'm protecting gas stoves. And, you know, this kind of tete a tete between those two. And I could see a rise where if Gavin's like, hey, nobody else can do this. I can at least be the anti that. And then he's a significant candidate at that point, maybe. What are your thoughts on how he addresses the constant negative media attention, the fabricated stories? Um, and then also, hopefully he didn't actually have anything, any, any punch in their skeleton, the closet or punch that's on the way because of something he's done in the past. And then also the uh, countering a, a potential Newsom or other person like him run. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting. I mean, right now, Newsom having uh, Newsom and DeSantis having each other as a foil is very politically useful for both of them. Um, I think DeSantis particularly enjoys that because he can sort of point to the scoreboard of all the people moving into Florida and out of California. Um, and that's kind of a big thing. And, and, you know, frankly, I think a lot of the budget problems in Sacramento probably are one of the reasons why Newsom has sort of reversed course and suddenly decided that he doesn't want to run. Well, obviously, part of it is simply that, you know, Democrats did pretty well in the midterms. And so there's not a big appetite right now among Democratic voters for a primary challenge to Biden, although the Democrats are sort of schizophrenic about that, because on the <laughs> one hand, all of their activist class and their um, elected officials are all like, look, it's treason to run against Biden. You can't, you know, presidents who get primaried lose, like, you know, everybody has to sit this one out. Um, and on the other hand, when you conduct opinion polls and like, you know, two thirds to three quarters of Democratic voters are like, please, we don't want Biden to run again. He's too yeah. old. He's not yeah. up to the job. We, we're worried, you know, we're worried about how well he's getting. So it's going to be interesting. But, um, you know, I mean, one of the other fascinating things about DeSantis in terms of a strategy and seeing whether it works right, mm -hmm. is that he has really taken a fairly extreme hard line on, you know what, I'm just not going to sit down and talk to the media at all, the national political press. You know, he'll talk to some Florida outlets. Uh, even in Florida, you know, he talks to some of the mainstream outlets there a bit um, at press conferences and stuff, but he's also spent a lot of time kind of talking to sort of in-the-bubble conservative media. Yeah. Um and I don't know that you can pull that off on a national race without you, at some point you do have to engage with the media. And frankly, I think you can in a Republican primary, you can score a lot of points by getting in the ring with them. Right. Jousting mm. with the whether it's debate moderators or, you know, staying at the podium for a press conference to get right. people asking you idiot questions that you can then dismantle. You know, because, I mean, DeSantis, part of his rise is that he's done that. Mm. Much in the way that Chris Christie did, right? I mean, he Christie sort of went viral with these various videos of him dressing down people at town hall meetings, um, and DeSantis has done that very effectively at times. But you know, you can't you can't fight people if you're not going to stand on a you know if you're not going to let them ask you questions. So 
that's going to be an interesting mm. dynamic is how much is he going to be willing to open up and talk to the media? He's not going to do what like John McCain did, right? He's not going to sit at the, sit in, in on the campaign bus uh, schmoozing the reporters for hours off camera, right? He doesn't like doing that. He's not comfortable doing that. And he has this sort of considered philosophy against treating the press as your friends. Uh, but he is going to have to probably engage them you know, much in the way that that as a lawyer, sooner or later, you have to deal with the, uh, you know, your adversaries in court. Yeah, you definitely do. The I'm thinking about uh, the response to COVID. And again, the, you know, the, the counterfoil between he and Newsom. I mean, I live in California and I love it here, right? But uh, but our governor banned golf, banned going to the beach, you know, th tennis, things that are clearly not going to get you sick because that's the tack that he took and his political environment that he had to work within. And, and so we took this approach. I don't know that we got off any easier or worse than Florida did, but you look at the completely different approach that DeSantis took, and that's going to sit well with a lot of people as we all look around and be like, hey, a lot of people were really shitty to one another. And um, I'd rather have that guy leaving it to me to do. But then again, there's going to be half the people saying the other thing. Yeah, and, and 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 look, this is one of the reasons I think why DeSantis has to run this cycle because you know by twenty twenty eight nobody's going to want to talk about COVID policy, right? Um, but you know, look, a, a lot of people were wrong. Um, in yeah. fact, I don't know of anybody who wasn't wrong about something. Right. Yes. Right. There were yeah. a lot of decisions that had to be made on the fly with poor information, um, and you know, the better call was to act as if some of these things were uncertain and unknowable and would require adjustment over time. Um, and I think, you know, DeSantis gets a lot of credit for that because that was his approach is to look, I'm going to do my own, you know, right. I'm going to do my own digging into the studies. And when I don't know what the answer is, I'm going to default to just letting people make their own decisions. Right. Um, and uh, and obviously, at a certain point, he did take a heavy hand towards, say, local government or even in some cases, businesses and said, you know what, you don't get to make your own decisions. You got to leave that to your citizens, your employees like you don't mm. get to impose that on them. But yeah. and, and, and that remains controversial. But um, I mean, one of my favorite examples with this is, you know, we had all these debates about vaccine mandates. Right. Right. And and you had all these people saying. You know what? Look, if you get vaccinated, uh, you can't spread COVID. And if you don't get vaccinated, you know, you're going to be like this walking machine spewing COVID everywhere. Right. right. It's, it's, Sonia Sotomayor was talking about this, about how like unvaccinated people are literally like unsafe machinery that's, you know, belching germs at everyone. And on right. the other hand, you had some of the, the more hardline anti-vax people saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 you know, Natural immunity. Like if you've had COVID, you're not going to get COVID again. Now, yeah. every one of us by this point knows somebody who like got COVID, got vaccinated and then got COVID again. Right. So yes. it's like they were both wrong. Natural immunity <laughs> was not, yeah. this, you know, natural immunity is good, but it's not it's not the panacea that some people presented it as. The vaccine also is not, it's really not a vaccine, right? In a, mm. in that sense, it doesn't prevent you from getting infected. It, yeah. you know, it makes the, it makes it less, it has lots of advantages in making it less severe, making you le marginally less likely to get the, get the, the, uh, the virus or spread it, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't protect you in that sense. Um, and so I think taking the view that, look, people got to make their own decisions and, um, you know, we should promote the vaccine, but we shouldn't force it on people uh, was the right call. And I think that's that's a big part of why people look at DeSantis and say, look, he made all those judgments. And, yeah. you know, he came out, you know, he came out a lot more right than than most other people. The, look, I'm in the middle. Right. And I want to say to you, like, you know, why why would I want DeSantis as a candidate? But, but I'm going to skip that. And I want to get into this. Um, the, the things that people say about DeSantis, particularly people on the left, and they'll say things like he's a racist and he doesn't teach he doesn't teach uh, black history in schools, which is, again, not true and hasn't been true. They are working through the AP approval process. And he has said, I don't want your politics in our schools. That's because the parents who have elected me don't want your politics in our schools. Uh, Will Riley made a great point. He said, how many blocks of education cover Thomas Sowell and his work? You want to talk about black education? Where is Thomas Sowell, right? And so we have these legitimate questions. 
I don't live in Florida. I used to. I don't live in Florida. I don't even have to say in all this. But all of a sudden, now this becomes this national story that is riddled with fallacies on both sides. But primarily, I'm talking about the left here. What, what is um? But what are we doing, Dan? Like, why why can't we? Like, we if you say, hey, DeSantis had a different approach that seems to have worked uh, in COVID. Uh, no, total rejection from reality. You know, he's he's not teaching black kids in school. That's actually not true. All of these things that are just not even worthy of discussion. They are so filled with fallacies, yet they're the prime discussion, at least in this news cycle. Yeah, I mean, and this is actually one of the communications challenges, right? Because then if you're a guy like DeSantis and you see that the media is just telling things that are just obviously untrue, um, on the one hand, you don't trust those people. You don't want to talk to them. On the other hand, right. it's like, how do you how do you use you know how do you use your own megaphone to you know, how do you, how do you how do you hijack their megaphone to right. get your message out right and Trump sometimes was able to do that just by being so blunt and crude that that they had to put him on the news saying what he was going to say um, so that's a challenge um, I mean I think you know I, I, and look I mean you've got DeSantis saying take this stuff out of the curriculum and then you've got J B Pritzker saying well Illinois is going to back out if you don't put it in but um i mean i think it's 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 interesting because so much though of the stuff about DeSantis is an authoritarian mm. i think the fallacy there is like you sort of ask folks on the left of center what makes them an authoritarian and you know it's like well you know he wants to use government power to do this and that you know he wants to tell private business what to do he wants to use government power to spread his ideas through the school system and it's like yeah you've just defined like what your political party has been doing at every level of government for a century. Like, yeah, <laughs> you not see it, right? Like th there's almost no way to sort of define, uh, you know, and yeah, okay. They, they, so then they kind of fall back to, well, he believes in like police stopping protests or something, but, but basically most of the grounds for calling DeSantis an authoritarian are ways of saying, He's he's you know he's sticking a toe in the game that the Democrats have been playing for a century now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so why why would I consider as a guy in the middle? Why would I consider DeSantis as a good presidential candidate? Like I'll say right now openly, I won't be voting for Joe Biden. But I don't necessarily am I going to vote for the Republican candidate either. I want to see someone who. I think can take us forward. And I'm big on consensus. So if Ron or Joe can build a consensus, I'm, I'm into that. But I don't see I don't see the Democrats and Joe Biden doing that. But I'm not sure that DeSantis isn't going to do things to punish the Democrats, which I don't I, I don't think that's a great way to run the country. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I mean, look, one thing, certainly, if you look at his record in Florida, um, you know, he has been very careful to try to pick these, you know, 70, 30, 80, 20 issues yeah. where he's not going for a full, you know, he's, he's, he's taking, you know, he's taking a slice. He's trying to see like, okay, how can I move the chains in my direction without going so far that I lose the public, right? There are very yeah. few things you can look at that he's done where he was just like, damn the voters, I'm ramming this through, right? Yeah. Every politicians can do that now and then, but right. uh, particularly on things that are way out of the public view. But, um, but you know, he, he really has tried to, now obviously he's working within the parameters of Florida, which is, you know, increasingly right of the country. Um, so, so, I mean, I do think there's that. I do think that he is a guy who's going to pay attention to where the public is and not try to get too far out in the, ahead of it in the other direction. Uh, and the other thing is simply, I think it, I really think it would be, it is time to have a president who's just sort of, you know, who's competent, um, who's younger, you know, a president who's not an old person. I think yeah. there is virtue in having somebody there who's been in the military. Um, you know, I always go back to sort of Churchill's line about the, you know, the great commander having sort of a touch of the sinister, uh, or I forget the exact, his exact phrasing, but, you know, um, uh, you know, a sinister and original touch. The, I, I do think that, you know, we're, we're the kind of guy where, you know, these sort of foreign uh, miscreants uh, who are running various countries around the world kind of wake up in the morning thinking not what am I going to do to the Americans, but what are the Americans going to do to me? Um, you know, I think there's value in that. Um, 
So, and, and you know what else? I, I honestly think, and I know that, again, you know, coming from a conservative Republican perspective, I'm talking self-interestedly here, but I really think that it would be enormously healthy for our politics um, to go through a cycle of a Republican president mm. who wins a clear national popular majority. Um, because so much of the poison of our politics um, is that on the one hand, you have Democrats thinking that, you know, there's no legitimate way a Republican can win. So the Republicans winning are just, you know, particularly because mm -hmm. they're pointing to, you know, Trump and, and George W. Bush both originally getting elected with less than less votes than their opponents. Um, and so that, you know, there's this idea that, that what the Republicans are doing, that the Republicans as a party are just illegitimate, right? That this, <laughs> there's only one legitimate political party in the yeah. country. And I think that's toxic and it leads to a lot of this kind of, you know, quote unquote, deep state stuff where people are trying yeah. to find a way yeah. to undermine and unseat the elected president. Um, and I think it's also, frankly, there's a faction of the Republican Party that has internalized yeah. this idea that, hey, we can't win a majority. We have to game the system, you know, or, 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 or we keep losing these majorities because the Democrats are cheating yeah. and we can't ever admit that we lost an election. And. And so I think that, the, you know, the, then these are two dynamics that play off of each other. Um, and, you know, it, granted, the Democrats keep doing this while not noticing the fact that um, they may have a larger political party than the Republicans, but they are clearly not a majority either. I mean, yeah. you know, Hillary didn't win a majority. Gore didn't win a majority. Uh, you know, Biden won a majority yeah. because he was able to get people who didn't so much like Biden, but just wanted to be rid of Trump. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, and that's obviously why the Democrats got pasted in the midterms in 2010 and 2014. And, um, you know, they, they did better than expected, but it's not like they had a great year in 2022. I mean, they, you know, they lost yeah. the House. I mean, so um, I do think it would be systemically very healthy. Um, and you know what else? You know mm. what else? Look, we've got in um, three years from now, we've got our. 250th birthday coming up as a country yes and boy it would be really nice to have a president a national leader at that time who oh, can please. say you know what i love america i love its history i love its founders i was proud to wear its uniform like you know i've taught history in school like let me you know i've yeah. written a book about how much i love the founding fathers and stuff and you know just sort of some of that rah rah america that i think is it may be corny and old fashioned, but but we really could use some of that. And I mm. I do think that he is somebody who is well situated to be able to make that pitch to the American people in 2026 that, you know, boy, this is a great place. Don't we all love this country? Yeah. Is that does that person exist from the Democrats? Is that person out there? I mean, I, honestly, Biden is sort of still the closest they have to it in the sense that, you know, he's. He, he does still kind of speak the language of the old school Union Hall Democrat um, to the extent that he speaks language at all in, in a comprehensible <laughs> fashion. Uh, yeah, but, says, yeah. you know, but yeah, I mean, they're so sort of eroded by so much of the kind of, you know, hair shirt progressivism. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some <laughs> other people, you know, there are some other people who who, who don't speak woke quite as thoroughly as. Sure. As, um, but yeah, I mean, the Democrats do have a, something of a deficit of that. I think they have a real problem simply with the fact that, um, you know, Biden is, Biden is kind of, he's trading off political capital that the Democrats aren't making any more of, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The, yeah. the, the old, you know, sort of the old, like, oh, you know, the Harry Truman kind of Democratic Party, like he's the last link to it. And when he's gone, they're not going to have any more of that left. They're not making new ones. Right. You know, there's a, a picture with uh, Ilan Om uh, Omar getting uh, kicked off of her you know, Foreign Affairs Committee. And by the way, I don't want to say this openly, too. Someone with her experience is important on the Foreign Affairs Committee. So there is some political punitiveness going on. And, but she's also said some things you're like, Ugh. but one of the things I think is remarkable and maybe something that Ron DeSantis can say is look how great our country is. We have someone who is an immigrant, female, black, Islamic person representing a, a district in our country and she's not alone like look at how much we've how far we've come and look at you know we all have these things this matter if you agree with their policy 
our country creates these environments where we can clash mightily. And we're, we're built to be a run and gun fight anyhow as a country politically. We're supposed to have the struggle and strife, but you and I are basically the same age. We can look back and go, God, look how far we've come, you know, and, and we're not stopping. Like, oh, this is where we're going to stay. We're going to continue to figure out how to be this country. And if anybody on that stage has a more complex environment than Florida to, to, to practice in, because I, you know, you know this, but I don't know if the audience knows this. Florida is full of the number one or number two population other than the home country. It, it's like all, all throughout it. So whether it's El Salvador or, you know, Cubans or Puerto Ricans, anything, all especially around the Caribbean countries, there is a lot of diversity there. And that might look like people of color, but you drive around and you see the Colombian flags and all these other places. It's not, it's not people of color. It's a true ethnic diversity. And he manages to, to manage that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, you know, it, it really is a place that is, you know, sort of kind of more American than America. Uh, right. I, I mean, I literally, I feel sometimes if I go down there and I come home and I'm like, you know, I feel like I visited another country and that country sure. is America, right? And now I'm back on Long Island. Like, yeah. But, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, yeah, I mean, the it, 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 it's a remarkably different, and I th look, I think that, again, I think that infects sort of the health of the Republic, the mental health of the Republican yeah. Party, right? Because yeah. I think, I think that the Florida Republicans and the Texas Republicans uh, in particular, and some of the other Sunbelt states have more confidence that, mm. you know, they can, they can sell their message to a more diverse population. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that, that, that they can, they can have a state that's full of, you know, mm. uh, white and black and Hispanic and Asian urban and rural and suburban and all of these different groups of people, um, you know, different kinds of diversity as well. And that you can, you can get that and turn that into a Republican electorate. And yeah. I think, you know, I think there are some places in the country where Republicans don't have that confidence. And so they sort of they, they react to new populations with fear because yeah. they think, oh, these these are just going to be Democrats, you know. And then like in Florida, you can't just be like, well, if the Hispanics will forget them. Like, you know, you, you do that. You're not going to last very long in Florida politics if that's your no. approach. It's uh, yeah, it's it's an amazing thing the 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 mix of people and styles and colors and flavors in in Florida and it is it is a a feather in DeSantis's cap that he's able to manage that pretty well. The um, I just hope that you know that we can have a sane election and look as a guy that's worked the elections in Iraq, I'm a little bit worried that we're going to continue to delegitimize or bleed legitimacy, even if it's the perception of it. Um, in our elections, because I've seen people in Iraq vote, and, and it's very hard to trick that system. We have a system that's much more permissive in terms of messing around. And if it doesn't take a plurality of, if all you need is 43% of the vote to win, well, that, that's an exploitable election, at least for my professional side of things as a counterintelligence guy, like I'm going to go find the key districts and I'm going to spend a couple million dollars and I'm going to try to flip them things. Yeah, maybe we need to offer people a choice where they can leave the voting place with either a red or a blue finger. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I have other questions about the political side of things, but 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 I do want to talk baseball because uh, it looks like it's going to be a great year for you and your Mets. Um, what is interesting to you about baseball coming up? Well. Um... You know, and as I saw somebody say on Twitter, you know, congratulations to Carlos Correa for signing uh, three of the 12 biggest free agent contracts in baseball history in a single <laughs> offseason. Um, but, uh, you know, the uh, the Korean War ended in a, uh, a stalemate and restoration of the status quo ante. So um, uh, it is going to be interesting. I mean, the Mets are interesting. I really do wish that Jacob deGrom had come back. But obviously, uh, in the very short run, uh, replacing him with Verlander is, uh, you know, this, that's kind of a wash. Um, yeah. I mean, Verlander was the best pitcher in the American league this year. Um, he did kind of run out of gas in September, uh, just as DeGrom did, although he, uh, you know, I think handled, handled October better. Um, yeah. and he ensures her, uh, an interesting combo. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a fun season. Um, uh, you know, I mean, look, the, the National League East is really loaded for bear because yeah. you've got two 
you know, 100 win teams, and, and, and then you've got the defending Bennett winners. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, pity the uh, the Marlins and the the, and the, the Nationals because yeah. they're they're just going to be cannon fodder. Yeah. It, the uh, on my side of things, we have you know the Dodgers, and they have built such a powerful machine. You don't, you know, they intend to compete every year. They certainly will this year, but they've got a chance to take all this young talent and either showcase and trade or or just leave in place and and. So um, Mike Petriello wrote a really interesting thing the other day. He did a, uh, like a reimagination of the Homer at the Bat Simpsons episode, and he ran uh, a simulation with like actual like what he considered to be nuclear plant, you know, capable players. And then he did replacement level players, and then he did league average level players in these scenarios. And the league average players, you know, with that lineup of, of good players, you know, Steve Sachs and Don Matting, they, they were in that show, but they weren't really very good, right? So given that, uh, no, those guys having, were both pretty pretty good. But I guess by 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 that point in their career, by that point, yeah. And so when you ran the 1992 version of these, some of these players, you know, Wade Boggs wasn't that good at that point. Uh, even with league average players, it was like a 120 win team, or maybe 130 wins. And so by just having people that are, you know, worth 1.5 WAR. You you shored up the the floor is so high on your on your team that you can really do one. I think that's sort of what um, the the Braves and the Dodgers do well is they have a, a very high base and then they have opportunities to go get more talent when they need it. Yeah, I mean that ability to um, and, and and it's it's I mean it's obviously massively important in football too, but but maybe a little less visible where a lot of the guys' contributions are harder to measure. But but that ability to keep um you know to have the strongest weakest link um in the league you know that's 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 so big because we have seen plenty of teams over the years that just had just a couple of really really crummy players um you know like there's like one guy in the bullpen who gets lit up all the time and you know one guy in the second baseman or somebody who can't hit his way out of a paper bag and Mm -hmm. you know just those couple of holes can can make a big difference to some yeah, hugely talented teams. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've all seen the teams that had three, four, five, like Hall of Fame caliber studs and just, yeah. you know, the Expos in the 80s, right? Like, Boy. you know, you, you get a team with Gary Carter and Andre Dawson, Tim Raines and uh, Steve Rogers, and, and they're turning out all these talented young pitchers, Bill Gullickson, Scott Sanderson, and, uh, you know, they bring in Al Oliver, he wins a batting title, and they keep winning like 83 games every year with them. Yeah. With that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Mets seem to have a little bit of that too. You guys have had your moments of brilliance, but it seems to be, it's very, it's gotta be frustrating for you. And you gotta be like, Oh, I don't know. We got these old guys and our history. And I think back to, um, you remember, well, I know you remember this when it was like Dwight Gooden, Ron Darling, Sid Fernandez. I mean, this was a loaded, a loaded rotation and uh, poof, you know, like the baseball gods don't abide that. They, they start collecting tendons and cocaine busts. And you're like, what happened to our team? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the 87 Mets were probably the team I was most invested in in my whole history as a baseball fan. And, and you know, it was an example of, you know, uh, sort of man proposes, God disposes, right? Like that team <laughs> had seven frontline starting pitchers, seven. And yeah. yet they still had like 25 games started by just replacement or sub replacement level starting pitchers yeah. because, you know, you had, you had this whole collection of misfortunes all to the same part of the team. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that happens, unfortunately. It does. It does. I've got a uh, Mariachi Garibaldi de Cuellar, uh, which is the Mariachi band that plays throughout the year at Dodger stadium. And it's just, you know, they've got their little 45 seconds several times a game to shine, but it is uh, very similar to what you guys have when your closer comes out. It just happens several times in the game. And every dude that has uh, any kind of a, a, a love for mariachi is serenading his girlfriend live in the stadium. And so you can imagine what that would look like in New York. And it's just this magical thing. When you go to a Mets game, what, what is the best thing about being there? Like, What is their mariachi Garibaldi moment where everybody is just like one big stadium full of love? I mean, love, you never get a stadium full of love in New York. Uh, <laughs> it's just, that's just the way New York is. Uh, I mean, it is true that the, the, the enthusiasm level this year for the entrance music for, <clears throat> for Edwin Diaz is off the charts, yeah. which is 
It's one of the most amazing turnarounds you will ever see because um, it is extremely, very, extremely difficult to find a player as unpopular as Edwin Diaz was in New York in 2019. Um, <laughs> you know, as universally loathed, feared, people, he would just walk in the game and people be like, well, where yeah. goes this one? Yeah. Um, and, and with good reason. I mean, he earned that. He, it was, he was so bad gave up so many big home back-breaking home runs. Um, and so to turn it around to the point where, you know, it became this like massive celebration when he walked in there um, is really something. But I was at the Mets' last victory of the year this year. So I went to mm. the one playoff game I went to was the second of the three games set against the Padres. Yeah. And DeGrom was pitching. And, you know, you go places, you go into a crowd – and I've been in crowds over the years, a lot of different kinds of crowds, right? You, you go to sports crowd, you go to political crowd, you go to like, you know, weddings and funerals and masses, you go to parades and stuff. And there's just something different when on those rare occasions when like the whole crowd is just absolutely on an emotional edge or an emotional high yeah, or, or, yeah. Or, or, or emotional rage, all about the same thing at the same time. Yeah. And it was that kind of crowd, you know, because I felt that way. I mean, to take it back to our original topic, I felt that way also when I went to see Elise Eldon rally out here okay. on the island that DeSantis, yeah. he had DeSantis in town for. But it really wasn't, I mean, DeSantis helped draw, but it was it was the Zeldin, uh, Zeldin feeling, you know, of like, this is our last hope to save our state kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and that crowd had that buzz, but the Mets crowd had that buzz too of like, you know, we're backed against the wall. Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden we blew the division, you know, we had the, we thought we had the division locked up. We blew that. Um, and now we're on the edge of, uh, you know, on the edge of being eliminated and here's yeah. Jacob DeGrom on the mound. Yeah. And yeah. you know, that, that crowd, that crowd was just, you know, it was just another, an that another level that you don't normally see. You only see once in a blue moon from a crowd. The also, I think about the uh, Don't Stop Believing Giants who had their three World Series. As soon as they played that song, Journey's a hometown band for, for us up there in San Francisco. And it's just one of those things where you're singing your heart out. And there's Steve Perry probably mouthing the words because he's not getting paid. But, you know, it's just a it's truly a unifying moment. I wanted to um, change the topic real quick, then go back to the Mets. So um, let's say that the Mets and I don't know where the betting book is right now, but let's say that they're the odds on favorite. Um, no matter what we do, you're 22%, if you get to the playoffs, likely that the best team wins the whole thing. Those are not very good odds. Maybe if your team's particularly great, you're 24%. You know, and that's the Dodgers fans this year, you know, they lost their minds because we lost, but it's like, this is not a, a good bet that, that you know, 80% of the time you're going to lose. It's just yeah. not. So how do you wrap your head around that? I mean, I do think it's sad that, that that baseball used to have a much stronger relationship between who's the best team and who wins it all than it does now. And I think just yeah. running them through the gauntlet of multiple rounds of playoffs is part of it. Um, I think the fact that, you know, pitcher, the stress on pitchers has gotten so much higher that it's so much harder now to, um, it's so much harder now to keep your frontline pitchers at their peak into and all through October. Um, and also, you know, uh, even when they are, they're not pitching as deep into games. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I miss, you know, the regular season meeting more. Yeah, and I, I don't enjoy three 100-mile-an-hour wiggly, bald arms, you know, in the bullpen waiting. You know, like these guys have one purpose, and, like, they come and impact the whole game so much. You know, you can really build a very dangerous team. The Padres were a very dangerous team last year. You know, the the Phillies were a very dangerous team. These these were, you know, and they the, weren't the best the Padres, team. But then yeah. the Padres killed the Mets with a guy who hit 190. <laughs> that's the thing, right? Yeah. But that's a three-game series. Anything can yeah. happen in a three-game yeah. series. Yeah. Hey, the Dodgers too. I mean, the 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 Padres center fielder is nothing. Well, you know, he's not that dangerous of a player. Grisham is nice. He's a good player, but he shouldn't beat you. But 
That one guy, you know, it's like Nellie Fox comes up hitting 220 for the year and knocks a home run. The one, you know, or uh, Ozzie Smith off a of Eden Fjord. There's a great one. You're like, well, how in the hell did that happen? But that's baseball. Yeah. But at least Ozzie was a great player. He just wasn't a home run hitter. But, you know, it's more like, yeah. you know, Brian Doyle. I yeah, guess, uh, would be your example, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I, I've had you for about an hour, and it's been awesome. And I love that we can have like a rational conversation about some things like Ron DeSantis and COVID, and and just try to sort out like you know where maybe we we could be and should be. And I love that you're writing for the National Review. I'm always reading and promoting what you do. What um, what do you want to say in closing before we wrap it up? Well, I guess you and I are just going to have to you know stare out the window and wait for it to be baseball season. Yeah, don't got long to wait. It'll be here soon. All right, stand by. Let me wrap it up. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you.